So with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce our two speakers today. We have, um, as I said, Annie Chung and Christy Portalis Reyes, both from the University of Georgia, Athens. And Annie is a, um, a broadly trained ecologist, actually so is Christy, a broadly trained community ecologist. Um, Annie leads the Plant and Microbial Ecology Lab at UGA. And she holds appointments currently with both the Department of Plant Biology and the Department of Plant Pathology. Um, so research in Annie's lab really spans a broad range of topics um, from microbial community assembly and plant soil feedbacks to competition and coexistence. And she's particularly fascinated by the interactions between plants and microbes and how um, understanding those interactions could really um, shed light on the, the uh, importance of, of those versus other coexistence mechanisms. So um, super cool work. Uh, Christy is also a broadly trained community ecologist and is currently a postdoc um, in Annie's lab. And Christy's particularly interested in issues around uh, global change, um, increased climate variability, and um, whether those will, uh, will affect uh, reversals and transitions in plant communities. Um, and Annie's a big fan of grasslands as well, she would be the first to admit. So um, Christy and Annie are leading the ecosystem, Ecosystems Transition Group um, in the uh, LTR synthesis uh, group, groups, and they're going to talk about that work that they're doing as part of that group today. So I will turn it over to our speakers. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, we are very excited to be here and share with you a little bit of what we've been working on. Uh, we want to begin by acknowledging that it's probably safe to say that many of us here in this room value diversity. Um, we as ecologists study many, many dimensions of biodiversity and our work has really helped highlight why diversity matters. However, um, I would argue that this is not represented in the types of knowledge systems and people that we engage with regularly in our scholarship. As Western scientists uh, studying the environment, our findings are sometimes knowledge that already exists and is known by um, indigenous scientists and scholars, as well as elders across the America and around the world. Because of this, we want to acknowledge that all of our sites are located in indigenous land, and most of our data are collected without the consent of these lands rightful stewards. Thinking of that, I would also like to share um, a reflection from Dr. Ren Walker Robbins, who is an indigenous scientist and educator that I had the privilege of learning from during my time in Minnesota. Uh, and what she taught us goes like this. So if we look outside our window and see a lawn, uh, which is one grass species, it is really hard to imagine that something like that would happen naturally um, or even by accident. It really takes a lot of effort to keep just one type of plant species in a lawn. Today, we will talk to you about communities where these types of ecosystem transitions happen, where perhaps only a few species persist, and we know and accept that this is because of our actions. But now I want you to think about who you work with and what types of knowledge uh, you engage with. Um, if you think that the diversity of knowledge and people you engage with is also lower than it should be, then I would like to invite you um, to think about ways that you can increase that and um, continue to take actions to make sure um, it happens. Personally, I'm a very optimistic person, so I hope that we live this seminar knowing that there are actions that we can take to both increase um, the diversity of knowledge systems and people we engage with, but also um, to continue conserving biodiversity in um, natural systems. Thanks so much, Christy, for starting us off. And to get into kind of the topic for today, I wanted to share that we all know that our environment is rapidly changing at an unprecedented rate. And so Christy and I are especially interested in how the effects of global multiple global change perturbations, things like rising carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, changes in the fire regime, um, and deposition rates interacts with the changing climate. You can go next, Christy, thank you. Um, in, in particular, we're not just interested in the past and predicted changes in climate means, but we're also interested in changes in variability. Together, um, these two forces could lead to difficult to reverse state shifts in ecosystems, such as some of those that Christy mentioned earlier. 
And to understand these phenomena requires kind of long-term experiments long enough to really capture the amount of climate variability and any state changes. And so luckily, we're now at the time where there exist several experiments that have been going on for long enough to produce data sets that can actually address these sorts of questions. The next slide. Um, and many such experiments exist throughout the LTER network. And Christy and I are really excited that the LTR and NC supported the formation of our synthesis group last spring. That's when we got funded and we started our group. And our goal is to really delve into, whoops, can we? <laughs> Thanks, Christy. Our goal is to really delve into these long-term perturbation experiments um, paired with maybe some climate data or climate manipulations. And we aim to use these data to investigate how anthropogenic drivers of change interact with climate variability to affect the probability of these critical ecosystem transitions. Now we're done. <laughs> and so we're really fortunate to have a diverse group of really wonderful scientists from all career stages and across kind of the experimental to theoretical spectrum. Um, members of our group, all pictured here, are affiliated with at least eight different LTR sites across the system and also with um, the LTAR network, which is the Long-Term Agricultural Research Network. And so we kicked off with our first full workshop meeting in June in 2021, so less than a year ago, um, and we did this online during a time when none of us could really meet in person due to the pandemic. And so I will hand it off now again to Christy to talk about kind of our approach to really make the most of this collective experience, knowledge, and curiosity of our group members to identify our first set of synthesis projects. Thank you, Annie. So yeah, first we will talk about some of the tools uh, for co-working online that we learn from uh, engaging with NCs and LTR and that we uh, applied in our working group. And then we'll also share a little bit about our ongoing projects. Uh, so first let's talk about those tools that have been very useful during um, the pandemic. Um, so as part of our funding and support for our working group, we had the opportunity to engage in different training sessions um, that allowed us to learn some really good tools for uh, working online. So for example, um, Lucas, Carmen, and I attended the Compass Science Communication Workshop, um, and then Lau, Annie, and myself attended the Reproducible Research course uh, from NCES, which we um, greatly recommend. We also had the opportunity to participate in the Neon Science Summit and the Future of Synthesis Workshop. Um, so a lot of these ideas come from our participation in these uh, programs, and uh, we are very grateful to have had the opportunity to learn them before starting uh, work in our group. So some of the tools that we use is that we prepared for our first meeting by first making sure we all had an opportunity to um, Make sure, to make sure that our ideas were heard and that we could express our interest for them. So we uh, made, we requested questions from all participants and then we grouped them by topic. And then we had everyone vote uh, for some of their favorites to get a sense of what we might be most excited to do as a group. Then we try to come up with a schedule uh, to work online that would simulate the type of engagement that we would be able to have in person by working both in a big group setting and small group settings. Um, and by trying to have enough um, sort of um, informal, uh, time for informal interactions, perhaps through breakout rooms um, and working with um, smaller groups. One of the activities that was very useful for us was to um, co-develop uh, methods and questions for the um, sort of the big areas that we identified um, before and throughout the start of our meeting. So we made sure that everyone had an opportunity to workshop what might be important questions and potential methods for different activities. This is an activity that you can do with your students. Uh, I have done it in ecology courses and it worked just as well um, with a bunch of um, people on Zoom as well. And from that, um, 
our, after our first meeting, we had identified four different distinct uh, topics or projects. So one of them has to do with just focusing on the effects of perturbations in community variability. Um, another one to focus on the effects of climate variability on community variability. Another group um, was very interested in just thinking more about um, evidence for ecosystem transitions. And then there's a subset of us that are also excited to think about taxes specific responses. So today we'll talk about some of these ongoing projects. In particular, we want to share with you um, three of the projects. So um, evidence for ecosystem transitions, taxes specific responses, and then we'll talk a little bit about climate sensitivity functions. So first let's talk about our group one, which is um, a group that is focused in trying to get, um, to understand what the experimental evidence for ecosystem transitions is. Um, I'm currently leading that group. And um, what our main questions are, are how often do we actually find evidence for ecosystem transitions that are difficult to reverse in ecosystems? So you might imagine that when we have um, an ecosystem state, you could think about diversity or grass cover um, or whatever you're interested in. As we manipulate different uh, environmental conditions or different perturbations, we might see both linear and nonlinear responses, but we might also see discontinuous responses that are perhaps difficult to reverse. So how often do we actually find that um, in field experiments? And then we know from the literature that sometimes very similar experiments that add nutrients to an ecosystem and then perhaps stop adding them might get different results. So in some cases we see evidence for a discontinuous transition, so perhaps an alternative state um, in diversity, for example, but other times we don't see that. So what could be driving the differences? And one of our hypotheses is that perhaps this is due um, to differences in um, environmental variability um, in these places where the experiments are happening. So our goals are to identify experimental data sets uh, where we could test for these difficult to reverse transitions. Um, and the way that we're doing this is through a systematic review of the literature. Uh, and what we're looking for is for examples of tests that test either discontinuity in a transition, which is um, in this figure from Schroeder et al shown in uh, with the number one. So when you manipulate perhaps an environmental variable, but you do, you do remain with the same state variable. So there's um, no change in diversity or no change in grass cover or forage cover. Um, and then also test for non-recovery. So once you've pushed a system perhaps out of a basin of attraction, um, if you reverse the system, um, if you reverse the environmental condition, are you still stuck in that same um, ecosystem state? And um, once, that, once we have that, um, our goal is to identify and harmonize um, relevant environmental and climate data that could help us understand why we might be finding differences between similar experiments at different places at different times. Um, we are also um, open to perhaps thinking about other um, data that could be potential drivers explaining these differences in experimental results. And then our, result, our resulting data product of having both these experimental data sets and um, adjoining climate data, then we could ask these questions about why we see this disparity in responses. Um, right now, we are in the process of um, doing the um, systematic review. So we have workshopped and worked together to identify what might be good search terms. So right now we have um, 18 search terms related to transition. So language about alternative states or hysteresis. Um, and we started from um, another review done by Tad Fukami, who's also in our group. Um, we also have 12 different um, types of language about manipulations because we are explicitly looking for experimental evidence. Um, we are also basing those on a recent um, paper from Hillebrand et al. And then we have 13 search terms that have to do with types of experiments. So this could be uh, reversal experiments or cessation experiments that would allow us to test um, some of those questions. And then when, if we just search for that, we would get 
tens of thousands of hits. So uh, to make this uh, manageable, we have decided to focus on um, sort of herbaceous terrestrial ecosystems. So with all those, we get um, 2,600 hits for articles. So we are now in the process of um, going through those. And one of the things that is encouraging is that if we plot the number of publications uh, per year for our search, we see that this is increasing. And now there's almost 250 papers per year. So I think it's a good time to do it before there's many more papers coming up this year and next year. Um, but also this um, is aligned with what other people have found in previous release of the literature for similar topics. Um, we are unsurprisingly finding that there will be a bias in the studies that we find in terms of the geography. So by looking at um, the sources of funding for the papers that we find as a proxy for where they might be located, we see that most of our, um, most of our papers um, are funded by um, North American, US, Canada, European uh, funding agencies. So they're likely um, in the global north, but there are also um, some funded by uh, the Chinese um, National Science Foundation. And then um, what we're doing right now is that we are working on going through those papers and um, determining which papers we should include. So for our particular uh, objective, we want all of them to be field experiments that um, are an appropriate experiment type. So either are uh, a reversal experiment where we could test for lack of recovery or perhaps um, an experiment that varies an ecosystem variable and we could test for discontinuity. Um, then we need the data to be available to have good periodic sampling. And then if so, then um, we can um, include it. And then hopefully we were in that in the process of doing that right now. And hopefully if we find um, few enough data sets, so in the couple hundreds, uh, what we'll do then is compile those data sets um, into a data product that includes also relevant climate data for the region and time in which the experiment took place and then get to ask our questions. Um, so ideally we will have a data product that will have um, an experiment that either found or did not find evidence for um, these difficult to reverse transitions and then um, data for potential drivers that could explain discrepancies in what we find from experiments across different places in the world. Then the second project, which I am not leading, um, uh, Carmen Neville, who is a graduate student, um, is leading this project. So this is about taxes specific responses. And we have nicknamed this the shave shifting subordinates. Um, and I'll explain why. So we're very interested in thinking about what these subdominant species might be doing. So if we think about um, species in an ecosystem or in a community existing in a range of um, abundance or rarity, uh, both in space and time, we might be able to categorize them based on whether they are transient or um, core species. So species that are often present or maybe have transient um, presence in our data sets and whether they are subdominant or dominant. So if we categorize them into these four um, different groups, um, when we have ambient conditions, then the question is what happens when perhaps there is environmental change? Will these species be excluded or will they um, switch category? So some of the questions that Carmen is um, currently exploring is um, do spatial and temporal rarity uh, predict species responses to drought? Are we able to predict how uh, core subdominant species uh, will respond to drought? And does the environment, so where you are at, um, filter the types of subordinate species that are present and in what proportions? So do we have similar types of rarity in a place like Sevillera as we do in Concept Prairie or at Cedar Creek? Um, or does that environment filter for different types of rarity? And then um, do any of these species have large shifts in persistence or abundance when there is an experimental drought or uh, rainfall manipulation? Um, and then does that change across the gradient? 
So some of the hypotheses um, that she is um, exploring is, for example, for one of the groups, a course of dominant species. So a species that is constantly present in the data set, but um, is not very abundant when it's in ambient conditions, when there is perhaps a reduction in rainfall or increased rainfall variability, will it remain a same core subdominant species or perhaps it will be excluded. It's unable to tolerate this change in precipitation and therefore might be excluded. Or perhaps um, this might provide competitive release from um, dominant species. So then it might become a, one of the more dominant species um, in the community. Um, and then of course, she's also interested in thinking about this across the many different sites that um, are represented in our data set. So right now, um, we, she's working on it. And the next steps for her are to find uh, the proportions of species in each category per site. So she's been doing this um, for uh, some of the dryland sites for Sevilleta, for example. Um, but she's working on um, getting the workflow going for all sites. And then at each side, um, are there specific transitions within categories? And then she will compare the responses across sites. So we're very excited and especially we're excited that um, we have leadership from uh, some of our earlier career colleagues. And with that, I will um, give it back to Annie for her to talk about uh, climate sensitivity functions. Thanks, Christy. And before we go on, I also just want to add that um, these kind of different groups one, two, and three that we're presenting here was our kind of approach to try to maintain steam throughout this period where we are not quite able yet to all convene together in person and really tackle these questions together. And so each of these groups are it can be thought of as essentially projects with individual project leaders. Um, who convene monthly meetings um, online with folks who are more or less interested in each of these sub projects from our overall synthesis group. And that's kind of the way we've been functioning um, between our first general meeting in June last year um, up till now. And so this group three um, climate sensitivity functions is one that I am leading. And so in this third project, we are focusing um, to, on multiple perturbations and increased climate variability to ask how do experimental perturbations alter population and community sensitivity to climate variation? Next, please. Um, so we are interested in the shape of the relationship between climate drivers and ecological responses, which is what we're calling climate sensitivity functions here. And that is because the shape of these nonlinear relationships suggests that future changes in climate variability could alter ecological responses, even if the long run mean does not change. Next, please. And so for example, um, in the first panel, so panel A, for a kind of concave and monotonically increasing response or, um, curve, such as shown here in the um, dashed line, increasing climate variability without changing the mean. So we can um, imagine it to be moving to the left and to the right along the x-axis um, will have negative effects on the response. And that is because the negative effects of, let's say the climate driver here is precipitation, the negative effects of decreased precipitation. And so um, this effect here outweighs the positive effects of increasing precipitation by the same amount away from the mean. Okay, next. And so if we apply similar logic to this kind of convex, also monotonically increasing response curve, um, shown in the solid line in panel B, we can see that in this sort of shape, increasing climate variability per se without changing the mean could have positive effects on the ecological response. Thanks. 
And then finally, for responses that may include both concave and convex shapes in their um, function, the effect of increasing climate variability would then depend on the mean. So in certain regions of the function at different parts of the mean, um, shifting from that mean with the same amount by the same amount of variability um, could cause either increasing or decreasing or let's rephrase positive or negative effects on the ecological response. Next. And so we're interested in figuring out you know, which perturbations and drivers can change the shape of these climate sensitivity functions and how, because, sorry, a little fly, um, it is crucial to understanding ecological responses to future shifts in climate means and variabilities, which we all know are currently happening. So next, please. To demonstrate this, um, we have successfully applied this approach to you know, one long-term experiment. Um, this is the end fertilization experiment at the Sevieta LTER. So this experiment was started in the 2004 is where we have data um, and just includes two treatments, control and nitrogen addition. And these results include data up to 2021. So that's 17 years worth of data. And so what we do is use model selection based on AICC to kind of inform the choice of nonlinear model fit. Um, for the relationship in this case between SPEI, which is a measure of kind of, you can think of it as a measure of droughtiness, um, and using above ground plant biomass as the response variable. And so for this experiment, the best fit model was a cubic response curve that interacted with the nitrogen addition treatment. And so biologically, for this site, what we found is that the N addition treatment increased the positive response um, of total above ground biomass to cooler, wetter conditions. So kind of towards the right hand side of this climate X axis, so the SVI axis um, at its more positive values, which suggests that for this site, um, nitrogen addition will result in a stronger interaction between shifting climate means and variance. So next slide, please. So from this first site, which is kind of our test case, um, we have put together a proposed workflow for fitting climate sensitivity functions and evaluating treatment effects across kind of the set of long term um, experiment data sets that we have. And so this includes kind of harmonizing data as the first step and making sure that we have some combination of either biomass or cover as a response variable and some sort of global change treatment, um, adding your specific climate data as the climate predictor um, and fitting a set of alternative models if you could click Christy. Um, and so we've come up with a standard set of alternative models for model selection to make sure that we're kind of um, evaluating among the set of options that could result, you know, stand from linear responses to all the way to a cubic response. Um, using kind of model selection to select against these alternative models. Um, we'll then finally evaluate the best model for each site for the shape of those um, climate sensitivity functions, so those shape parameters, and also for the effect of the treatment on the climate sensitivity function shape. Next. So that's kind of where we're at for this particular project. So we're at the stage um, where we are harmonizing all of the long-term data sets that we have. And um, the obvious next step is to apply that workflow that I just talked about to these other experimental data sets that we've identified. Um, and as we do so, one thing that we're thinking really carefully about is to try to achieve a little bit more of a quantitative understanding of the time series length that is required to adequately detect these nonlinear relationships for these functions, um, because this is something that is likely going to differ among the different sites, depending on just how variable 
um, the climates are between site among sites um, in terms of interannual climate variation. And so that is one thing that we're simultaneously working on to make sure that we are including the correct data sets to answer these, this question. Yeah, so even though we're all thinking about um, the question slightly different, I think one of the one of the commonalities between our different subgroups is that we're all thinking about how you know different perturbations, sometimes multiple perturbations, might be interacting with climate variability, and then how that might lead to these difficult to reverse transitions. There is there are examples of it in the literature, but it does remain um, a topic of um, debate whether we have enough evidence to. Um, assert that we do see this difficult to reverse shifts in ecosystems. So really what we're hoping to do is to understand how often do we see this? And then what are some of the characteristics um, in broad and um, specific terms that might be leading to these transitions? And um, with that, we would like to thank you all for um, attending and for your attention, but also thank all of our participants that have been engaging with us. Um, we have monthly meetings, sometimes two a month if you participate in several of the groups, um, as well as um, the LTR network and NCs who have been supporting our work um, and um, training for us, and uh, also the University of Georgia, which um, is where Annie and I are at right now. Thank you so much. I, I think because I'm unmuted, I'll do the clapping, but I'm sure there's a lot of remote clapping going on. Um, that was super interesting. Really appreciate um, the presentation. We've had a few, I'd like to remind everybody, the attendees, you can um, type your questions into the Q&A box. We have a few already um, loaded up there. So we'll start on those, but um, please attendees uh, type as, as you wish, if you have questions. So um, on Tien asks, um, how many data sets are you finding from LTER versus non-LTER? And do you notice any differences based on the source? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, when we saw that we had thousands of hits, I thought, well, maybe an easy way to start sorting through um, is to filter by, um, places where we know there will be good example of these types of experiments. Um, so I filter by any any um, paper that mentioned LTER, and unfortunately, only like 100 of those. Um, I think it was like 70-ish um, papers explicitly had LTER um, like in them. So a few, which I mean, it's exciting to perhaps there's other experiments that we just haven't considered yet. Um, but that also means we have a lot of work to do. Um, and yeah, there are, are there differences based on source? Um, I think one of the things that might be driving that we have uh, so few is that we might also be getting some uh, reviews and made analysis in our hit. So some of those will, will pare down the number of sources, but yeah, around a hundred of those 2,600 are LTR. Yeah, awesome. That actually leads into the next question by the same attendee. Um, is there anything you wish paper writers and or data providers would do more to make your job easier? That's a great question because it's um, it probably pertains to everybody listening about how we treat our papers and how we treat our data. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think perhaps um, there, there, might, there might be many experiments that are not um, in particular, reversal experiments might not be thought of as explicitly an experiment of ecosystem transitions or alternative stable states, but provide a great opportunity. So these might be, for example, experiments where there was um, a grazing um, regime or a burning um, regime in a place, and then perhaps for some reason funding or otherwise, um, the sites were abandoned, quote unquote. Um, the experiment didn't continue, but data continued to be collected. So those are some of the most valuable ones. So I think something that would make our job easier is even when there is um, 
low funding or um, no opportunities to continue experimental treatments, returning to those sites um, is often provides often a lot of very important data for how um, these ecosystems recover. Yeah, and I'd like to just add to that. I think some of the more general things we probably have all heard about, things like providing great metadata, making your data accessible or archivable or citable or having some sort of clear data reuse um, policy is always really helpful in the context um, in which you know, sometime in the future it may be uh, included in a synthesis project or used in some way, shape, or form that it was not originally collected for. Yeah, super. Okay. Um, we have another question. Um, apologies if I mispronounce any names. This virtual format is terrible for being corrected, but um, Tendena Wagner asks, um, how will you compare a return to previous state across these different grassland transitions um, manipulations? Abundances, biodiversity, presence, question mark. And, and you also, um, Christy and Annie, you can read the, the questions as well. Yeah, so that's a good question and it will be different uh, depending on data sets. So in some cases, our transitions might be um, in diversity. So we might have sites that had high diversity and then had um, perturbations that reduce diversity and perhaps this is persistent. We might have other um, ecosystems where perhaps there is a change in identity, so of which species are there, so from native to exotic, or we might have uh, transitions, for example, from a grassland to a shrubland. So um, depending on which one, on where the place is, uh, we will have um, different sort of state variables that will be our response. Yeah, and then just to add to that, I think you bring up a really good point in these different kind of levels of responses going from changes in relative abundance to then changes in presence and absence, which then ultimately affects biodiversity. And I think that is, you can we can think of it as kind of a hierarchy um, of uh, kind of temporal and spatial levels of response variables that we can consider um, when we consider transitions and ecosystems. Great, thanks. I'm going to take a question out of the chat now so that we don't miss it from Mariah Patton. First off, very cool work, and I agree with that. Um, super exciting stuff. Are you going to compare your um, NFERT versus the SPI results to sites with varying precipitation gradients? And do you think that you would see a difference? And that's over in the chat if you need to reread it. Yeah, definitely. I think that's one thing that we're really excited to um, consider is that, you know, having the same perturbation could have very, very different effects on climate sensitivity functions based on the geographic location and the current kind of the current climate of that site. And I think there's a lot of work out there that have shown um, the interacting effects of multiple limiting factors on let's say primary productivity. And so if water is not a limiting factor, then having um, and fertilization has a strong effect and kind of vice versa. So those interactive effects are something that we're really interested in. Chris, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> I think Annie did a great job there, yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Okay, um, there's another question in the Q&A. Again, apologies for pronunciation, but from maybe Supam Tiwari. Um, do you plan to quantify that? Oh, how do you plan to quantify that a state transition is linear, nonlinear, or irreversible? Um, and then to, to clarify, for example, how could you calculate um, the reversibility potential of the, um, the SEV grass to shrub transition? It's a really good question. I'm interested in this answer as well. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I think that's one of the um, sort of great opportunities that we have that in many cases, the our lack of ability to test these questions is that perhaps we haven't had um, enough time go by to actually get a long enough time series to see if something is reversible. Um, so the way that you can determine um, whether the the shape of the response, you can think about how your um, your 
state or your response variable uh, response to a environmental condition. Um, so you can plot it um, and then see whether their response is linear or uh, perhaps there's some sort of nonlinearity or discontinuity. Um, and for those, um, the reversal experiments are perhaps the like the best way um, to test that. But yeah, unfortunately, sometimes the 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 timeline um, or the like length of time that a species um, that we would expect species to shift in these ecosystems might be longer than our time series can test. So it is possible that there might be places where we might be able to find a, an example of a transition, but testing reversibility might be difficult um, if we don't have a long enough time series. And I imagine that hopefully not, but it's potentially Savieta might be one of those. I don't know. What do you think? Any is the Savieta expert? I I think I think your instinct is right with the Sev. I I think first, yeah, reversibility kind of reversibility potential is something that um, fundamentally we we, should, we want to get at with some sort of experimental manipulation. That would be the best way to test that. And Christy is absolutely correct, and that's something that we're actively considering in our group is that what is the relative, you know, let's say lifespan um, of the organisms involved in this ecosystem relative to the amount of time since manipulation or reversal, and do we even expect to have enough time for these organisms to have had responded um, in the case of the Sevieta, um, there are many organisms there, especially thinking just about plants very long lived perennial species um, is one type of species that can be very difficult to work with under this particular paradigm, just because having enough data to be able to show um, reversibility for these long lived organisms can be difficult. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Thanks. I, you know, I'm going to stay on this topic of re recovery um, and skip down to a question from Diane McKnight, but don't worry, on we'll get back to your question about data. Um, Diane asks, have you encountered ancillary information about the recovery of the streams in any of the grasslands? So do you think streams may recover more quickly? Removal of dams, for example, has resulted in more rapid recovery of fish in some cases than initially expected. Great question, Diane. Yeah, I could give an initial answer. Um, so I think part of the motivation for our group is that we do have examples of um, difficult to reverse ecosystem transitions in aquatic um, systems like streams or lakes, um, but we know less about what happens in um, terrestrial ecosystems and what that might mean for the persistence of some of the iconic um, ecosystems in North America. So for example, I, I love grasslands. Everyone that knows me knows that I love grasslands and uh, grassland conservation. So I think that was one of our motivations. Um, part of why it has been more difficult to answer these types of questions in grasslands and of course in forest systems is that um, as we were mentioning the lifespan of the organism. So grassland species can live in the decades and perhaps even a hundred years. Uh, so they're very long lived organisms. And um, it is very interesting to me to think about how the species might be able to withstand variability, uh, but also the sort of directional change in um, different perturbations. But yeah, our expertise is mostly on terrestrial ecosystems that we did think about. Uh, forming a team that uh, perhaps would have span expertise of both aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems, but uh, ultimately for the at least the first uh, set of questions and the first um, sort of um, participant uh, group, we went more towards focusing on um, terrestrial ecosystems where this question is a bit more debated still. Yeah, that's a great answer. You know, it almost kind of leads into this next question. So um, this is from Onigan, who identifies themselves as the LTER site um, uh, data manager at Beaufort. Uh, so, and that's why the uh, the data questions. 
Um, so um, on asked, do you plan to publish the data you've compiled as a product of the effort because it's a lot of work? And I'm gonna add a, a comment as well or a question, which is um, the possibility as well of uh, publishing your code from this project so that, for example, the next group who wants to work on streams or Diane who wants to you know, apply some of these techniques to, to stream data sets that, or other data sets that maybe you all can't focus on in your group could maybe do that. So can you comment about, about that? Yeah, and I will just add that like we would be excited to engage with other types of ecosystems, but I mean, as you saw, it is already a lot of, um, that can know a lot of data and papers to process. Um, so at the moment, yeah, we're focusing on that. But yeah, um, we do plan to, I mean, we have support from NCs um, to publish our data packages. And, um, you know, we have a GitHub repository. Um, we've not been quite as active uh, at it yet, but um, we, it all will be on GitHub and be publicly accessible. Um, yeah, and I, I find it very exciting that perhaps um, one of the results from this exercise is that we will be able to identify those sort of known um, go-to examples of um, good tests for ecosystem transitions, but also perhaps identify some experiments or data sets that perhaps we would have overlooked um, because they were not the ones that we um, normally read about. So yeah, hopefully we'll find a few more examples of good tests um, for these types of um, community dynamics. Yeah, and just to add to Jen's point and Christy's point as well, um, we are we would be excited if our code, let's say our code products would be helpful to facilitate other groups who are thinking about similar questions in different systems. Um, yeah, we would be more than happy to sit down for a discussion and chat about it and see if anything that we're developing would be of use. Yeah, awesome. Hopefully that's that's sort of why we do these webinars too, to try to put people together. So you all can um, definitely reach out to um, Christy and Annie as well about as their work progresses. And um, I think Marty has noted as well in the chat that you know it's actually a requirement of our L LNO synthesis funding that groups publish their derived data. So um, from all of, of the different groups that we've supported in the LNO, you can find um, code and data sets. And in some cases, we're hoping that, you know, the synthesis groups can actually build on one another as, as we move through the years of, of this kind of uh, project. So yeah, this is great. Um, it seems like we've come to the end of the questions and um, that are in the q and I I don't see any hands up and I don't see anything else in the chat. Um, so I, I do want to remind uh, the various attendees that we we do these webinars monthly. So next month's webinar is a little bit different. It's not one of the formally funded synthesis working groups, but it's going to be presented by Charlie Driscoll and Julia Jones on um, LTR climate research. So climate research that's happening across the network. So that should be really great. Um, and you can um, register for that one um, singly, but you've probably already registered for the whole series if you're here. So I'd like to plug that um, next month's webinar. Also, I, I'd like to mention that um, among the attendees here that we, we are um, planning to have a new synthesis working group RFP out sometime in the late spring or early summer. We don't have the exact dates um, for that yet, but we will be um, you know, uh, disseminating that information as widely as possible. But get ready, start thinking about more synthesis work. And Marty, maybe you want to add something to that? Uh, um, I just wanted to add that there will be a good long lead time on that. We don't expect that uh, the proposals for that to be due until after the all scientists meeting in the fall. Um, so you'll have, once the RFP comes out, you'll have a pretty good long time to put a group together and come up with uh, some great questions and descriptions. Great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Marty. All right, on that note, then I'd just like to thank you so much, Christy and Annie, for presenting um, your, your group. I really appreciated to talk, um, you know, I really appreciated your introduction, Christy, and also just a discussion of how you're proceeding along and doing this activity that normally we do so much in person, but has been kind of stymied a little bit from the pandemic. So I do appreciate um, that discussion. I bet that was uh, very useful for the attendees as well. Um, so we're all struggling to 
move forward in this crazy world. So yeah, so thank you so much. And thanks everybody for attending and we'll see you next month. Same, same place, same time, same computer screen. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll get a recording up in YouTube very soon. Great. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And